We're getting to that busy time of year again where we all have a lot of stuff going on. And so with that in mind, I decided to take a step back to the year 2019 and re-air one of my favorite episodes with you. It's the one where I got to speak with author Margaret George because her autobiography of Henry VIII was one of the very first Tudor books I ever read. So I hope you enjoy this revisit with Margaret George. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast with Rebecca Larson. Today, I'd like to welcome to the show very well-known author, Margaret George. Margaret, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. So many of my listeners know you probably best from the autobiography of Henry VIII, but I want to know, when did your love of history begin? Well, it began when I was a child. Uh, my father was in the Foreign Service, and when in the really uh, uh, formative years of being seven, eight, and nine years old, we lived in Tel Aviv, Israel. And uh, I went to a British school, so you can see where this is leading. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I learned a lot of British history in this. Even though I was only in you know, an elementary school, their school system really, it was very grown up for little kids, I think. And so not only did we have, did we have to, to, you know, pray for the king, the king <laughs> the morning exercises and learn about British history, but of course I was in in Israel surrounded by all this history and we studied history in my school. I still have those books. Uh, there was the, the House of History that started with Mesopotamia and it went on through Egypt and so on. And I got my father to take me to, to Egypt. And uh, so all this history was very real to me. And those two, the ancient and the, and the English, have always stuck with me. And I guess that shows that when what you learn when you're seven, eight, and nine, it really gets implanted. <laughs> so that's really when it got started. My father was really interested in history. And uh, I remember we went around, he ordered a lot of books about the Crusader castles and the Crusades. And he, he knew all of those things. And we would go visiting these castles and, and uh, learning all about Saladin. And, uh, well, so that's where it comes from. What a fascinating childhood you had. It, it was. It was an unusual one, really. Uh, very, very odd in some ways, but uh, but uh, very uh, special in others. Well, and I think, you know, you talked about, obviously, where the, your love of history began. And we know that you have a fascination with the Tudors. Um, who would you say is your favorite Tudor monarch and why? Well, first of all, we don't have that many to choose from. <laughs> so <laughs> there's only five of them. So I would say, of course, Henry. Uh, he's he's so operatic. He's so larger than life, and he lived a lot of different kind of phases because the young Henry was so different from the middle-aged Henry. It was different from the old Henry, and uh, you know he he created uh, a lot of social changes, but he also, in a way, was a victim of them. I mean, he had no. He had no power over Martin Luther starting Protestantism, and uh, that certainly influenced his reign. He had no uh, he had no control over a lot of things in his life. He felt that he did, but but he really didn't. And I thought that that makes him very modern in lots of ways. Because I think we all feel like we don't have a lot of control over our lives, not as much as we'd like, anyway. But he's a fascinating character, um, and I. I kind of wonder what he was like as a young man. I mean, meeting him as a young man would have been really interesting. Um, and he's kind of a tragic figure, too, like Nero. He's my favorite one, too. And I know a lot of people don't like him just because I think it's popular to dislike Henry VIII. 
Um, yes. And you have that fantastic number that he, you know, allegedly executed 72,000 people, which makes me laugh because that's a lot of people. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, and that's that's quoted and it's, it's, it's incorrect in the sense that he didn't execute them. <laughs> that was the law in England. Um, a lot of people got executed, you know, for stealing sheep and, and things like that. But that was not directly because of Henry. But it makes a good sound bite, you know, to say he executed 72,000 people. Um, but it was a very brutal time. Uh, you know, there was no prisons were not to hold people. I mean, they weren't supposed to stay there. They weren't for rehabilitation. They were just a holding pen until they got executed, usually. So, yeah, that's laid at his door, but I don't think that's quite fair. Thank you for clarifying that. That's always an argument that I I always try to come to bat against and go, come on. First of all, that is a lot of people. And if you look at the total population of England at the time, <laughs> yeah. if, he, if he executed that many during his reign and granted he reigned for like 38 years that'd be a, a large chunk of the population too yeah and i wonder where they got that that uh, number from anyway i mean you do find that often numbers are quoted they get started from somewhere uh someone's uh, tally and and no one ever goes back to check on it and say where did this come from and nobody updates it so i'm i, I really question whether they're even even if you figure in all the sheep, the sheep stealing <laughs> and things <laughs> like that, you, I still think you'd have trouble coming up with 72,000 people. I agree. I definitely agree. So other than the number of executions under Henry's belt, what do you believe is the biggest misconception about the Tudor dynasty in general? Well, uh, I'm not sure that in general there's a lot of misconceptions about them. I mean, they, they pretty much are somewhat like their their public uh, uh, image. That is, Henry VII really was stingy and, and hard-nosed, and Henry VIII really was, you know, over the top <laughs> in lots of ways. And, well, we can forget, and, and Mary, uh, you know, Mary Tudor certainly was a, a, a fervent Catholic who wanted who wanted to restore her mother's religion. And, of course, the times being what they were, you, you know, burning people was perfectly okay. Um, Elizabeth really was mysterious and um, very enigmatic, uh, very, very hard to ever get to know. Uh, she was a great ruler. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure uh, what misconceptions people have about them. The, the broad outline is pretty accurate, I think. Um, so what do you think? Well, you know, and it's funny, too, when you say that, I'm like, maybe I phrase that question <laughs> incorrectly. Uh, you know, I think maybe I go back to Henry the seventh and defeating Richard the third at Bosworth and how there's so many people that feel the Tudors did not belong on the throne, that they oh, didn't yeah. have a rightful claim to the throne. Yet I'm a firm believer that Henry Tudor won the, the crown on the battlefield and that makes it legitimate. That's true, and, and and certainly up until then, all the way through their history, a lot of kings had, you know, won through having the best army. So he's not the first, and usually the winner of the battle is the one that uh, that gets to wear the crown. The, to the winner go the spoils. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think people romanticize the Plantagenets and say, oh, the Plantagenets, so sad. You know, they shouldn't have been um, taken off the throne. But it seems that. You know, every dynasty sooner or later gets taken off the throne. Uh, certainly the Tudors didn't, you know, there were no more Tudors after Elizabeth. And uh, so it's just kind of, there is no such thing as a thousand year dynasty. Although people, you know, rulers always think theirs is going to be the one. Right. Yeah. The Plantagenets ruled for like over 300 years, if I'm remembering. Yeah, correct. That, they had a good run. <laughs> they did. It was time for somebody new. <laughs> yeah, they had a good run. Well, one of the things um, Henry VIII, of course, is most well known for is being married six times, which is crazy if you think about it. It is but crazy. <laughs> it is. He's like the Elizabeth Taylor of the yeah. 16th century. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, of, of his six wives, I'd be curious to know which one is your favorite. Well, that's uh, my favorite. I, I I would say the one that I was the most interested in as a person 
uh, her psychology and the whole uh, setup that she had with Henry uh, was was this Catherine Howard because um, she that whole tragedy and, and Lacey Baldwin Smith, a historian, had written an entire book called A Tudor Tragedy about her. Uh, she's probably the least well known of all of them, too, because she was so young. But one reason that I was fascinated with her and the reason I, I thought about it started me on the Henry VIII uh, trail was that I was at Hampton Court one time and the, I was up in that uh, place called the, the Haunted Gallery where supposedly Catherine Howard uh, tried to, to appeal to Henry and was beating on the door of the Chapel Royal for him to see her and the, the guards took her away and she was screaming. And, and uh, I thought, it just went through my mind, why do we know all about Anne Boleyn? And she's a household name, but hardly anybody knows the story about Catherine Howard. And they were very similar because they were cousins. And they they uh, they both met the same end for supposedly the same reason, and at that movie Vertigo, which was a movie with James Stewart and Kim Novak, it was made in the 1950s, a Hitchcock movie, which has since been acclaimed as one of the best movies of all time. But it was really about trying to recreate and bring back somebody from the dead that you were responsible for killing and trying to make it happen all over again. Like, like I want, I want another chance. I want a chance to have this happen again. And this time it's going to turn out differently. And I wondered if Henry, if that was his motive for getting involved with Catherine Howard, because she was, she was Anne's cousin. She looked like Anne. She was the same age. She was a young person. And that, uh, she was then accused, she actually did the things that Hannah was accused of, and it turned out the same way. She ended up being beheaded, just like Anne. But that whole, that whole psychological you know, triangle almost uh, fascinated me. And then as I got more into it, I, I saw it's also the same old story about an older man who wants to recreate his youth. And the whole psychological Thing about it fascinated me. She herself, I think, was really a pretty innocent and naive person. I mean, she when you read about some of the things that she did, you think, I can't believe anybody would be that foolish. Uh, <laughs> don't write love letters to Henry's uh, chamber attendant saying, you know, my heart is wanting to die when I think I cannot always be in your company. Catherine the Queen, <laughs> I mean, really. But she was just a teenager. And so I, though originally I just wanted to write that part, and then I thought, no, um, I have to write his whole story because if it's not in context, if you haven't seen him as a young man and seen him grow up and seen the other wives he has had, it doesn't really make as much sense. It's not as powerful. And then I got, got very interested in Henry himself because he was so in, different as a young man. So that's, that's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> She, I love Catherine Howard, too. I feel like the longer I study the Tudors, my answer changes every uh -huh. year. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think everybody is drawn to Anne Boleyn first because her story is so tragic and it's yeah. the one that's carried the longest over time. Yet all of his wives have their own tragic stories. They do. They do. You know, I am. Um... I've enjoyed watching that uh, The Spanish Princess, which is a miniseries made from Philippa Gregory's books. And, um, you know, sure, it's a miniseries and it has all, all the, the exaggerations and Hollywoodisms. But I, the young Catherine and the young Henry in that are, are very good. And it does take you back to her story because, you, you know, people think of her as just this this kind of old, sad dowager, you know, praying and, and, and being... being uh, mistreated by Henry, but there was a time when she was the young, beautiful princess, and she too has a long story. And of course, Anne Boleyn has a story, and Jane Seymour does, and Anne of Cleves. I went to the place where, I went to Cleves where, where Anne, Anne's castle was, and you know, you, it's so interesting to see it outside of England, to see this little castle in the small German duchy, and think that she went to England and became you know, Henry's wife, and then, then the beloved sister of Henry, and she too had a 
has a story. And of course, oh, of course, poor Catherine Parr. I mean, talk about a bad deal. <laughs> she really um, had the two elderly husbands. Then there was Henry, and then she marries Thomas Seymour, who you know turns out to be you know such a cad. And then she dies in childbirth. That's awful. So, you know, you're right. Every one of them is sympathetic in their own right, you know, not having especially to do with evil things that Henry did, but but uh, just in the things that life handed to them. You know, I love Catherine Parr, too. And something you may not know about me is I'm fascinated by Thomas Seymour. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I think you, I saw that. Yeah, he was a sexy guy, you know. <laughs> Um, no doubt about it. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he was quite a character and, and I've, I've, you know, he, he brought, he brought upon himself what happened, but mm-hmm. to him, but uh, he really is quite a character and I can see why you'd be attracted to him. It's a good thing that, that you can't be taken in by him in person because he would just make off with everything. <laughs> <laughs> So I, we've been talking about Henry for a long time, yeah. um, but probably the last question that I have about Henry for now is I'm very curious, what made you decide to call your book on him an autobiography? Oh, you know, that wasn't my choice. <laughs> that was my editor's choice. And I, I was a little, I, I didn't think it sounded right to me because autobiography to me is a very modern term. I mean, I don't think people in, in Henry's day would call it an autobiography, uh, but she she liked it and she and she said no no let's call it that. So um, I once someone even once said I heard somebody say that I was in a bookstore and I was standing there and I someone picked up the book they didn't know I was connected with it and they said autobiography of Henry VIII but they said but he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's dead. But they almost felt that you had to be alive to write the autobiography. Right, of course. right. Um, and then after that, you know, my other books, um, there was the memoirs of Cleopatra and the confessions of young Nero. <laughs> and, and finally, I just, we ran out of, um, you know, euphemisms for I'm telling this story. <laughs> but, but no, that was her idea. Um, well, thank you for getting the truth out there for all of us who have been curious about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I had some very artsy kind of title for it, as I recall. And uh, she said, and she's right about this. She said, you have to have the name of the character in the title. She said, mm-hmm. or people just aren't going to immediately know who it's about. So I have tried to do that ever since. I think that's true. If you have some some esoteric kind of quote from something and and you know, people don't know this is this is Henry VIII. So, the autobiography of Henry VIII certainly certainly put it out there. It's a wonderful book, and you thank you. You have honestly mastered writing a beautiful story. And I had watched an interview once um, where you talked about that moment for you where it kind of clicked, and where you were able to paint a scene maybe better than you were before in your writing. And I hope you know where I'm going with this because you had mentioned um, a class that you took that changed this for you. Oh yeah. You know, um, I, I took a screenwriting course uh, and, and just for fun, cause I like movies a lot, as you could tell by my reference to vertigo. Uh, and I really learned a tremendous amount there. And one thing that was that they said, you have to structure something correctly. Usually, if, if something isn't working, the problem is, is usually structure. And, and, and so it made me realize that, yeah, that scenes have to be structured. Uh, they can't just, be, can't just be interesting characters that you think are interesting and, um, and beautiful words. Although I think, of course, language is important. And I, I did study actually going underline things in... Um, you know, Fitzgerald and Yeats and especially Yeats and Poe and, uh, you know, people that use language beautifully uh, and uh, Keats and, and uh, Ray Bradbury, because I think I think that that's uh, you know, the, the sensual uh, things like the sun warmed porch or the, 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 the sound of the wind and the leaves, all those help make the scene seem real. But I think the screenwriting course was right about the structure. And I think that if you if you start out 
you have to decide is it whose point of view is it and and how are you going to get get to introduce the characters and so on and so on and and, and, you, and the hardest thing is working out the structure i think so i think i've pretty much i've learned how to do it uh, i'm not very good i'm very linear so the new the new um fashion for all this jumping around and 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 kind of going back and forth in time and and so on i i don't think i could I can't think that way. <laughs> I've even deconstructed novels that do that because, of course, the the, the writer cannot stop the reader from, from going ahead and, and putting putting the chapters back in the way that the reader wants them, so that so that it can become linear. So I'm I'm confessing now that I have done that to people's books because I just um, for me structure it has to be linear. You have to go forward and. Um, and have a kind of a coherence in it, for me anyway. I know it, it, a lot of people really like the jumping around, and that's, I say, more power to them, but I, I can't really do that. Well, we've talked a lot about Henry VIII, and now we've discovered how you became such a magnificent writer. Let's talk next about your book on Mary, Queen of Scots. So that one's Mary, Queen of Scotland and the Isles. That one looks like it was published in 1992. That's right. Um, and it's, that, had, it's had a resurgence recently because of the movie and the opera and everything. So it's one of those characters that, that never moves off stage completely. Yeah, yeah. And the, the one thing I noticed when I read that book is you spend a lot of time at the beginning of her life, so to speak, at French court. How many years did she spend there again? She was there 13 years. And, and talk about formative years. She went when she was five, and she didn't come back till she was 19. So therefore, you know, all these influences that you're going to have that stay with you the rest of your life. She was absolutely immersed in this French culture. And her mother was French. So she was half French anyway. Do you think she was as romantic as history enthusiasts like to believe she was? <laughs> well, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by romantic. Um, she's certainly a romantic heroine uh, in, in people's minds, but I think she was she was both an optimist and she was impulsive. So, in other words, she went with her intuition, uh, which would be fine, except that her intuition. Um, she was a bad judge of character. So, for example, the optimism and the impulsiveness. So she decided to go to England uh, after she had been, for the second time, um, lost a battle in Scotland and was obviously not going to get to keep her throne at all. And she decided, I'll go to England. Elizabeth will help put me back on the throne. And it was very impulsive and... It also was optimistic. It was like, of course Elizabeth will help me. Well, if she had really stopped to think about it, she would have realized that there were a lot of reasons why Elizabeth would not want to help her. Uh, one of them being that Mary had put the arms of England on her shield when she was in France. <laughs> and, and also that Elizabeth was unpredictable. And people begged Mary not to go. The people with her, uh, that when she was on that shore in that boat, said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But she did. So that's, that's the romantic part. She had a great deal of courage, no doubt about that. But she, I think that's where the romantic part comes in, because when we think of romance, we also think of kind of tragedy. And what do they call it? Tra uh, haste and waste is tragedy, and, and then uh, success is thrift and delay. And someone had said that Elizabeth was all about thrift and delay and Mary was all about haste and waste. So again, yeah, I, I think she certainly makes a good romantic heroine though. I always wonder if Mary's intent was indeed to take the throne of England. Did she really want that? Did she want to dethrone Elizabeth? Well, that's a good question. When, when, the, when she was in France, of course, the French and the English were always enemies. And uh, it, it suited her, her French uncles, her mother's brothers, who were very powerful at court, to push her to, you know, quarter her, the English arms on hers and to make a big deal about the, the, her right to the English throne. Um, I think when she fled to England, though, her, her motive was that, that England, that Elizabeth would help restore her to the Scottish throne. And, uh, of course, it didn't help that when she landed 
in England, she happened to stumble on the shore and grabbed the sand in her hands and said, I possess you, England. And of course, Elizabeth is going to hear about this. Uh, <laughs> that's what I mean. She was very impulsive. And, um, but I think after a while, you know, she, 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 was, she was hoping that somehow some miracle would happen and she would get to see Elizabeth because she, she had great faith in her charm and that if she could just get an interview with somebody, she could win them over. And that happened most times. Um, but when years went on and this wasn't happening, I think she got desperate. And she did say that, that she was being held really for no reason, that, that it was. And if you if you're if you're if you're held for no reason illegally, aren't you entitled to use any means to get out? And so I think it was really that she wanted to escape um, and it would take anybody that, that would promise to to help her escape, and even though that would that would mean and these were usually people who wanted to put her on the throne, um, and it was kind of like a package deal. I think her main motive was to get out, but she probably wouldn't have minded becoming the English queen either. And I think by that point she was so she was so disillusioned and angry at Elizabeth that she wouldn't have minded if Elizabeth had been assassinated. <laughs> in fact, she said that in writing, and of course that was what doomed her. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question is, do you think the execution of Mary was the, really the only possible outcome of their story? Well, ultimately, yes, if you think about the alternatives. Uh, so so here you have this woman, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, who is seen by Catholic Europe as the legitimate heir to the English throne because they saw Elizabeth as illegitimate. They didn't recognize Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn. So... And then on top of that, the Pope in, in 1570 declared that uh, that England, it, Elizabeth certainly was a usurper. She was not the right, rightful queen of England. And all of her Catholic so subjects were absolved of allegiance to her. He didn't really go so far as to say anybody who killed her was, you know, get my blessing, but he might as well have. So you have this, this person sitting right in England that... Uh, has a, that is this thorn in your side that, that is just recognized by others as being the true queen. Elizabeth was never quite sure of the loyalty of her subjects. I mean, she, she was very popular. She wanted to be popular, but when the chips were down, would they, would they really uh, obey her or, or go with the Pope? Would they support her or not? And then the Spanish, of course, were waiting to, to invade, but hoping that Mary would get on the throne. So, she couldn't, Elizabeth couldn't let her go back to Scotland for a couple of reasons. One, because meanwhile, there was a nice Protestant government installed in there with Mary's son, James, being brought up as a Protestant. And that was just the way Elizabeth wanted it. She wanted James to be brought up as a Protestant. She wanted a Protestant government in control there. If they let her go to France, the French might turn around. Well, of course, they recognized Mary instantly as queen, and then they might invade. So, and she kept trying to hold her, uh, you know, hoping that she just sort of the problem would just resolve itself. Mary would just stay a prisoner forever. But that was not in Mary's spirit to do that, and she was going to keep on trying to escape. And finally, uh, with when the last one happened, and and Walsingham and his his men were able to actually get in writing Elizabeth, uh, Mary's agreement that Elizabeth had to go. Uh, Parliament, Elizabeth still did not want to execute her for a lot of reasons, but one, probably because her mother was executed. Two, it sets a really bad example if an anointed sovereign can be executed. And I think Mary may have been the first one that that ever happened to. It certainly began to happen after that. You know, all the way up through Anne Marie Antoinette and so on. But at the time, it was really shocking. And and you know, if one can be, if your subject, if the subjects can execute one, they can execute another, and the next might be her. Uh, so there, that that was a reason that she didn't want to. So she delayed and delayed, and hope. And one of Mary's schemes involved becoming engaged to the Duke of Norfolk, and he had gotten executed. And Elizabeth hoped that he would kind of like satisfy Parliament, but it didn't. And they, they said, look, you know, you, you don't care about us. If you don't execute this woman, you don't care about us, your subjects, because you're going to rob us of our queen and put her in, 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 in place. 
And if you, if you care about us, if you love us, you've got to do this. And so she, her hands were really kind of tied. So she did, but I don't think her, her breakdown after that was, was staged. Some people think they were staged, but probably it was very traumatic for her. Not that she wasn't glad to have her off the scene, but of course, then that launched the Spanish Armada, uh, because now the only way that they could get Elizabeth off the throne if, if was to invade. The Spanish weren't going to have a handy candidate in the wings. So that's, that's another, yeah, I, I think it was the only possible outcome, ultimately, oh, given their characters. I, I tend to agree with that, too. And, you know, and Queen Elizabeth has really captured the heart of so many Tudor enth- enthusiasts as well. And it's probably because, you know, she was Gloriana. It uh-huh. seemed like her reign was so spectacular and people were happy and so you went about and you wrote a novel about her in 2012. And I just recently purchased this and forgive me, I have yet to start reading it, but I noticed that you begin the, her story in 1588. And I'm curious, why did you choose 1588? Well, because first of all, um, I, I had, I had written about her childhood in Henry and certainly all the middle years I had written about, it was almost a dual novel with the Mary Queen of Scots. So I wanted to take up where I left off before. But also, I think that period of her life, it, it's often neglected, but it's a very important period because it, it lasted 15 years. Uh, and it, and it, she was a lame duck through this because, for one thing, she was already 55 and nobody expected her to live very long. I mean, her nobody else in her family had, and people didn't live that long then. So she was, she was this lame duck, a female sovereign. And so then you have all the problems of a lame duck. You have loss of power. You have... Uh, you have to disguise weakness, weakness, because people are looking for it all the time. But look at how people say, oh, is so-and-so, I think he's losing it. Um, I think so-and-so, did he seem a little befuddled? You know, I think she's too old. Um, and then people planning for a future without you. I mean, you know, which they're doing, they're plotting, they're planning a future without you because they think that it's going to be very soon. So her, her great need was to keep control and I found that really interesting, all the ways that she tried to keep control. And the three big crises in, in her reign all clustered about that time. There was the Mary Queen of Scots execution, which just took place, but it still was reverberating in 1588. And then there was the Armada. And then there was the, the, the rebellion of the Earl of Essex. And so... Uh, also, that whole period really is the part when we think of the Elizabethan era. I actually didn't get started till about 1587, which is when Shakespeare came to, to London and got started writing. So we think about you know Shakespeare and, and we think about the, the whole music and the whole society then. A lot of it really was in the latter part of her reign. And you know, get the first colony in, in the New World, uh, You've got um, Roanoke, and you've got the naming of the of the uh, colony of Virginia, so named after the Virgin Queen. So it's a very rich period, and I think that people don't um, write about it so much because she's older, and also because the romance aspects of her life have kind of uh, faded away. <laughs> Except she did have that late romance with the French, the French dolphin, the, the frog, and she came very close to marrying him. It's really fascinating, but she she uh, was 17 years younger, and yet, why did she almost marry him? She seemed to be very affectionate toward him, but there was sort of like, suddenly maybe she thought, I'd like to be married. I have to try being married, but it was so traumatic for her that, that she announced her engagement one evening, and by the next day, she had to call it off. Uh, so you get all of this psychological um uh, drama in this in this period, but as I said, because Dudley is kind of, you know, he's already married to Latisse, and and he's kind of off the scene. People tend not to uh, like that as much, and not like the thing is not she's not courting twenty five suitors like she was when she was younger. <laughs> Maybe it's a it's a it's a time of life that doesn't attract 
people interested in romance, but I think politically, for political junkies, it's a very interesting period. So for anybody who's going to pick up your book, if they have yet to read it, they can expect to learn more about the Armada. They can expect to learn more about maybe her relationship or lack of relationship with Dudley. Uh, What else? What else am I missing? They kind of settled into an old shoe relationship. I mean, they were very fond of each other to the very end, and I think his death was devastating to her. But I think it's like, you know, people that that, that have old old lovers that resurface, you know, like years later because they they find them on Facebook and and they meet again and and you know the passion is kind of gone, but the affection is still there. And I think that that was the twilight of their relationship. And also you can expect to see uh, you know, the whole thing about a woman, uh, especially a woman clinging to power with all of her with all of her intellectual resources and doing everything she can to hide from people any any sign of weakness. So psychologically, it's very interesting, I think. I'm very curious because you are American, like I am. How do you go about researching your novels and finding all of these? facts that you're able to put into the books? Well, you know, it, it, everything, it, most things are in print, of course. And in the old when I started out, I had to obtain all these books. And Mary Queen of Scots, also, there's a, just a set of Victorian books, one by uh, in the late 1800s, written by Agnes Strickland called Lives of the Queens of England. It's a multi-volume set. And then there was Lives of the Queens of Scotland, which is much harder to find. I was able to find them in Edinburgh. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that, that you just have to go there. You have to be persistent to, to, uh, look things up. You have to spend a lot of time in museums. And, but the thing is, it is a lot easier now because of the internet. I mean, when I was doing Henry and Mary Queen of Scots, there was no internet. So, you know, you had to, you had to go there and spend a lot of time there and, and go to used bookstores to find these old books. Uh, and by the time I did Elizabeth, of course, it was different. We had, you know, 2011. Uh, but I think interesting about you saying I'm an American because people ask, you know, how was I so accepted in England with Henry? And it was on the Sunday Times bestseller list for several weeks. Well, I think they thought I was English because of my name, <laughs> which is my real name. And I, I was English like generations ago, my family was. But but I think that I, I kind of slid under the radar because my name made them think I was English. Of course, as soon as they hear me talk, they knew that isn't true. Right, right. It's funny because when I first started out, two people just automatically assumed that I was as well. And it's like, you can be an American and still have a passion for English history. Yeah. It's it's yeah. not unknown. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of Americans are passionate about it. There's no barrier to being interested in English history. Right. We're both upper Midwesterners. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I feel like I have to say, don't you know, and you betcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious, too. Um, at the moment, are you working on any other projects? Well, you know, it's interesting. I may switch to <gasps> America <laughs> only because of two things. Um, one, I we have bought a, a 1795 house in Washington, D.C., which was one of the first houses built in Washington uh, after they finally settled that that was going to be the capital. And uh, they gave uh, permission to, you know, there's always developers, always developers rush in to, to do projects. So, so the developers came in and they built a, a, these early row of houses. And so... You know, I think that I that house has seen so much American history, and and I kind of neglected American history because, um, you know, I was so involved with European and ancient and everything. But I'm getting very interested in American history, and I I would like to explore that more. But I have a ways to go with that because, uh, I mean, I my I'm, it's almost like I'm I'm starting out as a real novice, which is a which is a challenge. But of course, I was with Henry too. And uh, I think that whole that whole time, you know, is is interesting. And then going further back, uh, you know, I, I think uh, of all things, you know, who who would I be interested in 
in, in working. I, I'm very interested in Pocahontas because I think there, there again, of course, she has the two sides. She, she It's incredible that she could have started out as she was and in the society she was in and then end up going to the court in England. And, and, and being introduced to the king and queen. It's just kind of mind-blowing. Uh, I've always wanted to visit her grave, which is down the Thames a bit, because she, she died when she, the English climate was too much. Um, I've always wanted to visit her grave, but I'm curious about her, too. So I may venture into America. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm working on a one-act play about Nero, speaking of screenplays. Uh, for this for this uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, it would be a, only a one hour thing. It's it's very different to write a play than a novel, though. I'm finding out. So those are my possible projects, um, and um, you know, new new worlds to explore. I love that you're unafraid to try different things. It's 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 the spice of life, really, isn't it? It is because I think if you just if you always do something that you're so familiar with. It's comforting, but there's a great joy in discovering something you know new, a whole new area, or a whole new time in history and and uh, you know it, it keeps you keeps you young and keeps you alive, I think. Yeah. Well, I'm just you know we're getting down to the end of the questions here and there's a question that I ask every one of my uh, guests on the show that I would like to ask you as well. If I were t- able to give you a time machine, Margaret, and you were able to travel back in time and safely return, where and when would you travel to? Okay, well, this uh, I would I would go to Alexandria because it, there are no Ptolemaic cities now. There are no Hellenistic beautiful cities that don't exist. I mean, if someone once said, if you want to see what ancient Rome looked like, go to Washington D.C. because we have all these intact classical buildings. And I'd love to see, of course, Cleopatra herself. I'd love to see and hear her because supposedly she had this beautiful voice that was like a, a, a harp being played. And that, and that also that, that she wasn't beautiful, but you couldn't be in her presence for very long without being utterly entranced by her. Well, that's a very abstract kind of, kind of description. I would like to see it in action. I'd like to see what there was about her, and I'd like to watch. So, yes, I would go to Alexandria, and I would spend uh, the afternoon with Cleopatra in her palace. (laughs) And uh, you also mentioned that um, whether someone asked if I'd done research in the Library of Alexandria. Well, when I was doing Cleopatra, that... uh, that library didn't exist yet. It, it, ground was not broken yet. I think it was just barely broken. There was a, uh, some digging, but the buildings and the and the library itself uh, was still in the future. So no, I was not able to do that. Uh, I'd like to see the Alexandria Library. Hey, if I went back there, can I stay like a couple of days so I can see both the palace and the library? <laughs> So I, and the lighthouse. I think I need about a week there, really, in my time <laughs> machine. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful, though, if we yeah. just go experience it and come back with all of oh, that information? No. I would. I I daydream about that. Mm. Okay, so what would my listeners be surprised to learn about you that maybe they would never expect to know? Well, what they would be surprised to learn is that I'm a sprinter and a long jumper, a competitive one. And so when uh, the, the 100 meters, the 200 meters, 400 meters, and the long jump, and um, I, I just love track and field. <laughs> and so in the sections in uh, the Nero book, the volume two, there's a Nero went off to Greece to um, compete in all the Panama games. And I have a number of things about races in there. And because I, I actually went to a, a reenactment one there in Greece, uh, I had the personal experience of doing this. So, so when I write about it, I have really done it. And I, and I, I enjoyed writing about it. They had a complete reenactment. You had to run barefoot and then a tunic and everything. And that was, that was great fun. But it also, you know, really helps you to know what, what it was like for the people then because athletics were so important to that particular mm-hmm. culture. 
I wish you could see the big smile on my face right now (laughs) because I was in track and field when I was in high school and I was a sprinter, a middle distance runner and a triple jumper. Oh, really? Okay. So you, you are after my own heart. Oh, well, you know that we sprinters have to stick together. I tell you all those marathon people, (laughs) right? They're crazy. When you say you run, they always assume it's marathons. And I've heard people say, so, so how's your marathon? I I don't run marathons. I mean, 400 meters is a long way from me. It so. <laughs> is. It is. I'll have to say the 400 um, was my specialty when I was in like middle school. Um, but I soon tired of it because it, it is hard. It's a sprint. That's one it's whole, sprint. you know. It's a oh. sprint. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I prefer so, tr- I've preferred the jumping, the triple jump. But let me tell you, I did a number on my knees and now I can't run anymore. Oh, and, no. Yeah, it makes well, me sad. I loved running. It was therapeutic. Yeah, that's too bad. Well, I stayed away from the triple jump for that reason because it, I knew it was harder with the with the three things, and I thought I better stick with just one, the one landing, and not three. So. <laughs> oh, Margaret, it was so fun to talk to you today and learn all about your your books and how they came about. And thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm I'm so pleased that you thought of it, and I've enjoyed it very much. And um, let us be in touch as we Midwesterners and and uh, Sprinters uh, gotta <laughs> stay in touch. And I will let you know what happens about my 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 foray into American history. Oh, we can't wait. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.